Father's Day message this morning, uh, the message is not intended to be just for fathers. Uh, all that I plan to cover today is, is especially, it's certainly applicable for dads, but you'll see that men and women, boys and girls can benefit from this message. And I believe that the Lord put on my heart this morning. And my own personal opinion is that what I have today is especially relevant to young people in our current social dynamics. Uh, it's imperative for us as followers of Christ to see uh, the world and what is happening in it through the spiritual eyes and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, friends, otherwise we risk becoming like the world swept up by this river of popular opinion and social media frenzy rather than the word of God. My hope, young people, uh, young adults, fathers, uh, men, women, boys and girls, is to equip you this morning to stand firm on the word of God. To stand firm like a rock in the middle of a rapid current. Um, two weeks ago, we had the privilege of going to Yellowstone, and I saw the powerful, fast-moving current of the Yellowstone River. And every so often, in the middle, there was this giant rock that was just not movable. And it was a beautiful sight to see, let me tell you. And friends, that is the image for us this morning. Seeing the world and the people in it through the eyes of Christ, um, having this spiritual vision by the power of the Holy Spirit, we stand firm on the Word of God with, and, and, and let me tell you, no social current will be able to carry us away. We need God's vision. We need God's Word to help us discern God's voice. Um, Holy Spirit, uh, help us this morning to hear from you. Open our hearts to your message and help us stand firm on the truth of your word. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So this morning, I want to share with you five practical guidelines to anchor ourselves in God and begin to have uh, this kind of vision that he wants us to have. These Five practical guidelines that I believe we can draw out of chapter 22 of the book of Isaiah. So grab your Bibles, uh, electronic Bibles, paper Bibles, doesn't matter, and open them up to Isaiah chapter 22. I will read a portion of the text and then share the, the practical guideline and then move on to the next section of the text. That way we'll cover the entire text and these five practical guidelines, and then I'll wrap up with some bottom line thoughts. Okay, so that's where we're going this morning. So let's start with reading Isaiah chapter 22, uh, in verse 1. Isaiah 22 in verse 1 says the following. A prophecy um, regarding the valley of vision, the valley of vision. What troubles you now that you have all gone up to the roofs? You town so full of commotion, you city of tumult and revelry. Your slain were not killed by the sword, nor did they die in battle. All your leaders have fled together. They have been captured without using the bow. All you who were caught were taken prisoner together, having fled while the enemy was still far away. Therefore, I said, turn away from me. Let me just weep bitterly. Don't try to console me over the destruction of my people. Okay, so this is the first section. All right, so what is the text saying? Well, it starts out with a bit of a, I don't know, it, I think of it as a slap upside the head, right or wrong. But, but it's, it's the prophet saying, what's the matter with you that you go up on the roofs to party? What's the matter with you? What in the world were you thinking? There are no heroes or courageous leaders to celebrate. They're all cowards, surrounded by a society of cowards. They ran away and got captured by the enemy. That's what, the, that's what this section is saying. What's the matter with you? What troubles you? What's the matter with you? You're, you're partying. Isn't that right? And then the prophet, upon realizing this truth, is absolutely crushed. 
the people of God, who are supposed to be uh, God's message to the nations, turned away from their God-given responsibility. Instead of serving God with courage, they ran away and cowered and when faced with opposition or when faced with these overwhelming odds stacked up against them. They caved in, quite honestly. They caved in. And, and maybe, maybe this morning you look around and, and you feel the same sense of, of hopelessness, like Isaiah, or, or perhaps the overwhelming odds against you make you want to run away and hide. Oh, just get me out of here. Just, I, want to, I need a vacation. I, I need to go away. Oh, I need to get away from all this. And friends, neither of these two options are a helpful long-term solutions. Uh, which brings me to the first guideline, the first anchor line that secures us in, in God. So we can begin to have that kind of vision that he wants us to have. And the anchor line is courage. The anchor line is courage. Live boldly and don't run from responsibility. Live boldly and do not run from responsibility. Friends, without courage, you can't see the world with spiritual eyes. You just can't. Let me tell you, you need courage to see that perhaps your heart might, be, might need cleansing. You need courage uh, to see that perhaps your political views need to be brought in line with the Holy Spirit. You need courage to admit a wrong. Friends, it takes courage to be humble. It takes courage to love selflessly, an agape kind of love. It takes courage to stand up against evil. It takes courage to stand up for our Lord Jesus Christ. And it takes courage to see the world through the eyes of Christ. What kind of courage do you need this morning? What, what responsibility do you need to take head on? Maybe you felt that the Lord wants you to talk to a friend about Jesus. Or, or maybe you, you sense the Holy Spirit nudging you to invite somebody to explore together God's word. Friends, don't shy away. Live boldly and take on the responsibility God is asking you to take. But let me tell you, courage by itself it's just not enough. Let's read the next section of our text. Here's, here's what it says. Verse 5. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, has a day of tumult and trampling and terror in the valley of vision. A day of battering down walls and of crying out to the mountains. Elam takes up the quiver with her charioteers and horses. Kerr uncovers the shields. Your choices valleys are full of chariots and horsemen are posted at the city gates. The Lord stripped away the defenses of Judah and you looked in that day to the weapons in the palace of the forest. You saw the walls of the city of David were broken down through many places. You stored up water in the lower pool. You counted the buildings in Jerusalem and tore down houses to strengthen the wall. You built reservoirs be, uh, between the two walls for the water of the old pool. But, but, you did not look on to the one who made it, or have regard for the one who planned it long ago. So friends, this section of the text tells us that while under siege, the people of Jerusalem, the people of this valley of vision, did all the right things. They planned well. They took inventory. They allocated resources. They took on the right activities except one. They ignored God. And let me tell you, friends, it happens like that today in our modern day. When people run out of options, then, then write to God. They run to God after they do all this other stuff. And friends, that's backwards. That is backwards. See, the, the second anchor line is reliance. It's reliance. Depend on the Lord, not on your own resources. God gives us resources of all kinds so he can use them for his purpose. What we have is really not our own when you think about it. 
It has been given to us, and we ought to be God's stewards. See, when it's all said and done, if we begin to see these resources as ours, we begin to rely on them for our comfort, for security. And, and we end up like this, the, people, the people of our text. They did the right planning, the right resource allocations. They did all the right things, right action, right management, but they ignored God. As we come to the end of our fiscal year at Agape, I'm, re, I'm reminded to depend on the Lord and not our own resources. I, I am challenged by, by this text to look at myself and ask myself, what am I relying on? Am I relying on the resources or am I relying on the Lord? You see, I have this propensity to be like the people in the text. I, I, I have this bent to plan. I have this bent to allocate, to take action. But the Holy Spirit reminds me, reliance. Depend on me, says the Holy Spirit, not your resources. I gave those to you. They're mine, says the Holy Spirit. Friends, in what way do you place your security on other things? What is it that you rely on? Is it retirement accounts, health, family, or friends? Is there a specific area in your own life where you need to rely on God more rather than what is around you? In what ways is God calling you out this morning and saying, Reliance, depend on me, trust in me in this journey ahead? And let me tell you, for the journey ahead, there's no better guide. There's no better guide. And the Holy Spirit, the Lord himself says, look to me first. Call on me first. All right, so we have courage, we have reliance, and let's continue. Let's move on. In verse 12, now verse 12, the Lord, the Lord Almighty called you on that day to weep and to wail, to tear out your hair and put on sackcloth. But see, there's joy and revelry, slaughtering of cattle and killing of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink, you say, for tomorrow we die. The Lord Almighty has revealed this in my hearing. Till your dying day, this sin will not be atoned for, says the Lord, the Lord Almighty. All right, friends, the, the third anchor line the third anchor line is gravity. Gravity. Not, not like the stuff that's on the, on, you know, calling us on the earth, you know, like the science part. It's, it's really embrace the sorrow that comes your way, not just the joys. Embrace the sorrow that comes your way, not just the joys. I believe, friends, I believe this with all my heart, but I believe there's a cultural trend to always look for the party. To always seek the good times. If you don't believe me, scroll through the social media posts. The posts scream, hey, look at me. Look at all the delicious food I'm eating. Look at the, how happy I am. Now, now, friends, don't get me wrong. I love a good party. No, those of you that know me well, you know that I love a good party. But sometimes life brings sorrow. Sometimes life brings sorrow. What do we do? Do we ignore it and chase after the party? Uh, Romans 12, 15 says that we should rejoice with those who rejoice and to mourn with those who mourn. I get it. Sorrow is not fun. I mean, it's not. Sorrow is not fun. I, I get it. But the scripture says that sometimes God calls us to weep. And, and when that happens, when God calls us to weep, the worst thing we can do is ignore it. I see a cultural trend emerge, especially from advertisers too. And the sentiment in the advertisement is something, in advertisement is something like this. Why wait? Why wait? Look, enjoy your stuff now. Have your fun now uh, when you can and when you're young. Do it now. Do it now. Who knows what the world will be like tomorrow? Party now, eh, pay later. 
Party now. Eh, pay later. Are you being enticed by this cultural whisper? Are you surrounded by grief right now? Perhaps in this grief, you might be tempted to think that other things will provide solutions. Perhaps in your, when you're surrounded by, by grief, you might be tempted to say, well, let me, let me try this drink, let me try this drug, let me try this fill-in-the-blank activity and forget about my grief. Things that may not be the healthiest for you. But so what? Try it and forget about it. Friends, we need gravity, not just levity. We need gravity, not just levity. What sorrow and grief do you see around you? Perhaps, perhaps the Lord is asking you to weep alongside. As a follower of Christ, we are the messengers of hope in desperate times. Let's not run from it. Let's not run from our responsibility. Courage. Reliance. Gravity. And next comes care. Care. Lead as God's servants, not for selfish ambition. Lead as God's stewards, not for selfish ambition. Care. Verse 15. This is what the Lord, the Lord Almighty says. Go say to the steward, to Shebna, the palace administrator, what are you doing here? Who, who gave you permission to cut out a grave for yourself here, hewing your grave on the height and, and chiseling your resting place in the rock? Beware. The Lord is about to, make, to take firm hold of you and hurl you away, you mighty man. He will roll you up tightly like, like a ball and, and, and throw you into a large country. There you will die. And there the chariots that you're so proud of will become a disgrace to your master's house. I will depose you from your office and you will be ousted from your position. See, Shebna, Shebna wanted to make a name for himself. Clearly, he was a very ambitious individual. And in, in, in ancient times, the, the, the grandeur of a person's tomb showed how important that person was. Shabna wanted to show the world that he was, he was something special. And instead of governing as a steward of God's people for their interest, he did things for himself. I really don't think that he really cared for the people. Now, you may not be a palace administrator like Shebna, but you have been given some responsibility in your own context. Maybe you're a mom or dad, or a manager, or a factory worker, or, or, or office worker, or a teacher, student. Perhaps you're a big brother or sister. Regardless of who you are and what you do, you have influence over people and things. You, you even have influence over your friends. So did Shabna, and he carried only for himself. And that's the danger. The fourth anchor line is care. And friends, this is close related to love. We are called to care and to love. We will never see the world with spiritual eyes if we care only for ourselves. Who is God calling you to care about? to care for. Some of you I know are, are, are full-time caregivers. You know how difficult that is. You know how challenging that can be. But perhaps God is calling you to care also about someone else. Or, or maybe God is calling you to be less concerned with yourself and what you need to do and to look up and look around. See, there, there's people around you that God put in your path so you can care for them. And that's how we do acts of kindness. And, and let me tell you, you will need courage <laughs> to do that. You will need courage. You will need to depend on God. You will need to embrace the gravity of the situation so you can show them that God cares. And when you do that, let me tell you, when you do that, you bring hope. You become the messenger of good news. 
Good news. That, that's the gospel. That is the gospel that God loved us so much. He loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son, Jesus of Nazareth, so that whoever trusts in Jesus will never be let down. They will never experience, an, uh, they will never experience a, a, a disappointment. Why? Well, because Jesus promised an abundant life. Now, not one with health and wealth. And, and, and remember, the gravity of the situation, we are called to embrace, embrace the sorrow. But Jesus described that even in the midst of sorrow, we will experience the love and the peace of God, the abundant life that can only be described as the life of ages. The life of ages of ages. In other words, eternal life. See, in all eternity, God put you and me in a time and place unique to you. And there's only one of you, and there's only one of me. And some of you are thinking, thank God there's only one of you. And I get that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. There's only one of you, and there's only one of me. And we are here. We are here together. See, in our text, in the next session, God put uh, a person named Eliakim in a special and specific time and place for a purpose, for a very specific purpose. Let's look at the text. Verse 20. In that day, I will summon my servant Eliakim, son of Helkiah. I will clothe him with your robe, that's Shebna's robe, by the way, and fasten your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the people of Judah. I will place on his shoulders the key of the house of David, and he, what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I will drive him like a peg into a firm place. He will become a seat of honor for the house of his father. All the glory of his family will hang on him. It's offspring, it's offshoots, and all the vessels from the bowls to all the jars. In that day, declares the Lord Almighty, the peg driven to the firm place will, will give way. It, it will be sheared off and, and will fall. And the load hanging on it will be cut down. The Lord has spoken. You see, friends, Eliakim is brought to power. But his time does have an end also. See, the, the chapter had a beginning, then it had a middle, and then a new chapter starts. Like all of us, actually, right? It, the last anchor line, friends, the last anchor line that I'm going to cover in our text is purpose. Purpose. God placed you and I for a time in a specific place. Our life is filled with chapters. Uh, many of us do not remember the first chapter, uh, except through pictures if they're available. Uh, that's the time when, as babies, we were cared for. I don't know, do you have baby pictures? <laughs> that's, that's the first chapter. Maybe the second chapter is your early childhood. And that's when you learn about friendships and imagination and, and adventure. Then come the school years. Um, that's a longer chapter with many different sections than early adulthood. And some of us today, we have, we have more chapters written than others. But regardless of the number of chapters, it's important to reflect on our time and our place. No one can say how many chapters are ahead. No one. But we can all say that we have this time now. We are here in this place now, and you and I are unique. And God intended us for, to, for us to be here. God has a purpose for you. God has a purpose for me. Each chapter in our lives, friends. Each chapter has a purpose, and it's our privilege to discover it. Are you excited to discover it? Young people, do you know what your purpose is? Do you, are you ready to discover it? Do you want to? Well, young people, let me tell you this. 
and, and, for, and not just young people, all of you who are young at heart, let me share a secret. Some of the details of life that stress you out will work themselves out. In the grand eternity, those details will work themselves out. Even the painful chapters of your life will. Remember, that's embracing the gravity, not just the levity of a situation. But let me tell you, regardless of the details, if you are anchored on the word of God, nothing will shake you. Nothing will shake you. Like, like a big stone boulder in the middle of that raging river. Friends, how blessed we are to have the scriptures in our own language. How blessed we are. See, the prophet Micah offers great insight. In Micah chapter 6, verse 8, he wrote, here, these, are, these are amazing words. Here, here they are. He, meaning God, has shown you, O mortal, what is good. <laughs> Isn't that true? We have the scriptures. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And, and what does the Lord require of you? Have you ever heard people say, well, what is, what's God's will for my life? Well, here's the answer. Here it is. It, what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Friends, we need God's vision. We need God's word to help us discern God's voice. When we stand firm on the word of God, no social current will be able to carry us away. Grab onto these anchor lines. And if you reflect on these, I believe the Holy Spirit will nudge you in the right direction. He'll nudge you on what to do. And, and that is why we are together. As you sense this nudging, as you sense the Holy Spirit speaking to you, share it. Uh, process the details with someone in our community. That is so important. Friends, let me tell you, Christianity, Christianity is not a lone wolf religion. Christianity, friends, it's a relationship. By definition, it is processed together. Christianity is a relationship. And we need to be in community with one another and help one another discern God's voice. Friends, if you're not yet part of a small group uh, and you like to be, uh, would you please contact me? I, I'd love to help. Now, if you've been around Agape for some time, let's, let's rekindle our small group fellowship. It is so critical to be in community with one another. Would you bring this up in your prayer time before the Lord? And friends, let's do this. Let's start the next chapter of our church body. Let's start that now. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, we come together in the name of your Son, Jesus. And we know that whenever two or three are gathered in your name, we know, Heavenly Father, that Jesus is among us. So, Father, please help us that we may sense the presence of, of, of Jesus. By the power of the Holy Spirit, help us see the way, help us see the world the way you see it. Enable us to live boldly and not run from responsibility of being your ambassadors. Lord, give us the desire to depend on you rather than our own resources. Comfort us, Father. Comfort us as we embrace the gravity of sorrowful situations. Help us to care for one another. Help us lead as good stewards. Protect us, Father. Protect us from selfish ambition and from pride. Heavenly Father, we trust that in your wisdom, you have placed us for a time in this specific place, to live among family, friends, neighbors, and, and, and strangers. May we live rightly. May we live godly lives. May we live intentionally, pursuing and discovering the mission to which you have called us, every single one of us. Heavenly Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, please continue to nudge us towards obedience, for we pray all this in the name of our Lord and King, Jesus Christ.
Amen.